to get the heel ahead of the inside part of the ball relative yes. to the target. Uh -huh. Then from there, the pressure being pinched down into it, like the squishing effect to yeah. the ball, that's where the handle stops. Right. It almost becomes a perfectly flat lead wrist yeah. at the takeaway. Right. And then from there, he basically just rolls the knuckles a little bit. Right. And then he goes underneath with that's, it. And that's, that's the it. key, though. If he didn't roll those knuckles, then that face would technically be too open because that's yeah. more of like the that's neutral what, grip move. That's right. right. One of my favorite shots I teach all my students, and my best students will say this is like the simplest way to do it. Right. Is close. <laughs> that the golf swing is 90% hands and arms. It used to be, like back in the 20s and 30s with Harry Varden and Henry Cotton and all these guys, they were saying that it was 90% hands and arms. Where did that get lost? Like why, why did we lose that? How's it going everybody? Welcome back to the Cause and Effect podcast where we introduce the cause and effect relationships that exist in golf in relation to the hand to handle to club relationships. Uh, episode 17, uh, we took a week off. We got our studio ready. Yep. Let's yep. go. Yep. Gosh, yep. that was... Shot uh, some content. <laughs> yeah, we shot some content. If you um, saw that, we did the the three and the three. So we kind of expanded a little bit more on that, which yep. was, that was a good piece of content that we did. Um, it's going to be fun. We're just going to have so much more like freedom to just push out so much more content. Like we, we've talked a lot about, I mean, there's plenty of archived podcasts. If you're just getting here, we've talked about everything under the sun when it comes to yeah. the connection to the club and the claws and that's all there. Uh, but today this is going to be just a little bit more, um, I don't know, just talking about like our experience as coaches um, and I don't know, just like a little more laid back. It's things most common problems that we see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like we, we have a ton of experience in teaching, so mm -hmm. it's going to be cool just to kind of talk about that a little bit and sure it's Thanksgiving week. So happy Thanksgiving, yep. everybody. Thanksgiving. Uh, Jonathan's birthday today. Happy yep. birthday, old man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to go to the casino tonight and see yep. if we can tear it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Uh, yeah, it's going to be really, I just want to start off right off the rip with um, just talking about some of the stuff that we have planned for the studio. So we have our archive content coming uh, with Claw Code, which is really just going to be um, just a step-by-step -step process of if you were building your swing from scratch, where would you start? Almost in your like game a, as well, almost. In the yeah. We're going to walk through everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like short game, driving, uh, punch shots, like Chipping, different pitching. scenarios, yeah. things like yeah. that. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have that out, uh, very soon. Um, but yeah, the studio is nice. It's just, it's a, it's a really nice professional environment. Yep. Uh, we got our Clothoria driving range, which is cool. For the right ground. Um, yep. so yeah, just renewed our foresight subscription. So we're, we're good to go. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're good to go. Are, yeah. Um, so yeah, so Jonathan and I, I mean, we, we've, we've taught a lot of golf lessons. I mean, what i mean between i'm well two, over twenty five thousand. yeah i'm yeah. yeah i'm probably like 15 to 17 probably mm -hmm. um so we've seen a lot yeah um i think i've what, seen it pretty much all I mean, yeah you yeah we we've both we've both seen quite a bit i mean you <laughs> yeah you've seen a lot um but really we want to just talk about like why we're doing all of this and why we started claw and everything and uh we actually just had a monumental moment today our patent for our smart grip yep. was officially issued so um, yeah, this technology, uh, this is one of our like first prototypes, but this is kind of like a relic, <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but yeah, all this technology with the pressure sensors and, um, triaxial accelerators and gyroscopes. Um, yeah, that's all going to be hopefully in everybody's golf club someday. Right. So, um, yeah, we've been working on that for the last three years and that's actually what motivated us to create this podcast is, uh, we, we found out a lot when we were doing that, um, uh, patent and really creating, um, everything with that grip and we figured it would help a lot of people. So before we get this grip out, we're like, Hey, we learned a lot. Like, let's help people. Like when you created the code, when we had the template for everything for, um, for the claws, it's like, let's, let's get this out there and start telling people. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's not being talked about enough. You've heard us vent about this many, many times. Um, it's not, um, I see like a couple common things I see just right off the rip. Um, when I look at people online is, some things that coaches are teaching that I really don't, I'm not a huge fan of. And one being that I think people are staying way too close to the golf ball. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I see like Gankus and uh, like some of these other guys, they have their people so close to the ball and like have bad posture. And I'm just like, I don't like that. Like, I feel like it's just hard to 
get it on the 45. Like I know they're doing a lot with like hand path and things like that to manipulate it. But like, what's your thoughts on that? Like, I know we talk about this a lot. Like we like a certain distance from the ball with every club. Like, what do you think? So, I mean, I'm an Afghan. I believe that basically in golf, everything comes down to like the geometrics, like everything from like posture with the back trying to be flat, um, like locking your legs in the beginning when you go to bend forward, because it's all about getting all these angles right to then support the 45 degree plane. And yes, the 45 will change a little bit upon like a wedge or a mid iron or a driver. Right. And your posture will also change like opposed to being 45 degrees bent forward. That's like for a seven iron. Right. And then it will go up or down a little bit depending on the club you're hitting. Correct. But the idea though, is that like everything's on 45 nineties Yeah. and it's like, and that's really what, you know, it's all about if you, so if you think about that way, if you're staying too close to the ball, your chances of getting on the 45 or supporting it properly and consistently is going to be minimized. I feel like you, if you're staying too close, if you're going to make it work, you have to work your hands and arms a little bit more inward in the backswing and in the follow through. And if your arms start going around your body too much, I feel like it's hard to maintain proper connection, Mm -hmm. but it's also especially hard to keep like your lead arm locked to post impact to your finish properly. Which is why we see a lot of of breakdown when we look at swings like that, that are promoting a lot of that rotation and the inward hand path on the backswing, which, I mean, there has to be some depth. Like we get that. We understand like depth and um, things like that, but yeah, the follow through, that's the big one where when you see that lead shoulder really like pulling out of the shot aggressively and it's like, how do you support impact? It's really hard. Yeah. I mean, most people, when they start off golf, I mean, the problems that they commonly will have is, of course, grip's going to be off a little bit. Their swing triangle's not going to be probably properly connected, which means their shoulders are not going to be properly in position, right? Because right, right. the forearm rotations in positions really affect that. Yeah. Um, which then also skews your alignment of your like perception of where you think you're aimed, but in reality, you may not be because mm. of this, right? Um and then we also would see people playing the ball too far forward in their stance. And I think one of the leading problems for that is because they're um, commonly open with their shoulders and hips set, set up, yeah. it naturally like points their perspective more forward. So it looks like the ball is more in the middle of their stance, <laughs> yeah. but it's actually way too it's far like forward. It's like an illusion. Right. And so beca- because of the open stance, ball forward, uh, we'll say commonly people, you know, they don't have the handle forward press at all. It's set up. It's pretty neutral. Yeah. Um, and then they'll tend to sway a little bit to the top. Right. And then if from the top, they'll open up their shoulders and then they're coming over the top. And then that's where we see the chicken. We're yeah, going to so chicken are, turkey, but no, no, uh, the, turkey the, week, turkey the turkey wing, turkey wing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so, for the Thanksgiving you know, we're, week. We're down cause, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, those are, yeah. So these are just common problems that we've seen like yeah. throughout all of our years of but teaching. It, but if you think about that, how that, what we just talked about though, like that is the pattern that we see and how it escalates. Yeah. Standing too close to the right. ball and then aiming too far left. And then now you've just introduced the ball like being so too, many well, so different problems. Again, because the ball is too far forward and because of everything, <laughs> if you sway and everything you, in your mind, you're looking at the distance to the ball. So you feel like you have to like, in a sense, throw your shoulders at it and try to move your energy back, just hit the ball. And by that time you're already out to end. Right. So if like you play the ball back in your stance more naturally to hit the ball properly, you can't open up from the top. If you do that, you're going to like top the ball or like hit it really low and, you know, to the right, like thin fade. Mm. Right. So it's like you have to pre-close your body a little bit at setup, have the handle forward properly, make sure the club goes in enough in the back swing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. so making sure that the club opposed to going like straight back goes a little bit more inward. And then from the top, we're going to try to keep like the trail hip and shoulder pin back and trying to drive like the handle and the heel let's say slightly to right field and we're trying for to a right hand golfer. We're trying to keep them pinned back just because we're trying to keep the body like in tilt, right? Right. Well, like in we're tilt, trying to keep but, the trail shoulder lower than the lead, right? Yeah. Because that's important. Right. Very important. Right. Yeah. Well, but in retrospect more so, it's like idea wise, you know, again, if you have the ball more back, like if I play the ball off my trail foot, mm-hmm. I have to go in and I have to hold the body back so that I can go back out and push the handle because with the way the gear effect works, if the ball is too far back, or if let's just say if the ball is too, I'm sorry, if the ball is in the back of the stance and you go back, you go a little bit in and you open up, you're starting to get the club face to be closed, like relative to the target and target line. Mm. So imagine like at setup, drawing a laser beam right through the face to the intended target. Yeah. And if at any point, if the club head gets outside that target line too much, even if the face is like, let's say, Let's say we had a um, strong grip 
and we properly like you know rotate the face open in mm-hmm. the backswing but if the club is too far outside the target line mm-hmm. the face is actually pointing left of my antenna target which is close to the target which oh, is where the slice comes in right right got but it. if i take this same hand and club positioning and move it inward enough mm-hmm. properly now we're not close to the target we're properly open mm. and that's how you can support your proper ratios with the swing path relative to the face angle got it got okay it. okay so what you're saying is that and this goes back to again being too close to the ball is that if you're too close to the ball that's already promoting like a ver- the, like a very a vertical, vertical swing plane. and outward so you've mm-hmm. got to really exaggerate how inward you're going with those hands sure. to get that proper like inside out like, or if direction. you went like straight back to the top kind of vertical like column montgomery <laughs> and then from <laughs> right. there though if, if you drop it to the inside enough and shallow out then right. you could still make it work but like I a just, matthew wolf kind of oh well no but matthew wolf's more in with his hands though yeah yeah he because right, of right. his loop move loop. you know yeah, big but right. and that's i think one thing too so if you think about jim Furyk's swing he used to really look crowded at setup right very but the reason he made that or how he made that work though was he went you know in with his hands first about two three inches mm-hmm. first move so he would go like this face yeah. would be kind of hooded he would then go straight out away from his body like this uh-huh. let the club come back in that was his big loop and then deliver it down the line and it was just exaggerated, but because of the out and then the back under move, uh-huh. he was able to stand close to the ball and still be able to make proper contact. But the first move had to be in, in though. It, yeah. So yeah, if he yeah. didn't go in first, if he would have went straight back or out first and then just went straight trouble. out and looped it, it would have been a lot. I mean, he wouldn't be able to support the phase in the path relationships near as easily. Right. And I can say from my own um, experience that I have done this move where you go straight out away in the takeaway yeah. and then you let it loop back. And I've actually hit the ball of the best I've ever hit in my life sometimes. Yeah, right? I've seen you, I've seen you play that way many times. Just, and it was, it like, was just hard yeah. to get the short game right though. That was where I was like, I, if I'm going to do a move, I want to try to keep it consistent throughout my game. Yeah, and, you right. know, and it's like, and then I look at Matthew Wolf and how he has to do his little loop move for a little bunker shot. Oof. And I'm just like, man, nope. I don't know if I want to have this, you know, That's scary. anxiety of like <laughs> yeah. having to make this crazy move just for a small shot. But well, anyway, you got to hit thousands of golf balls to like, be yeah, ingrained, yeah, be comfortable that, right. to be comfortable with that. Correct. For sure. Correct. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's a big um, topic for people, though, to understand again, um, you know, because most people are slicing the ball too, right? Yeah. Um, or they're hitting like low hooks. Maybe the face is in the same position like this relative to their hand, but it's coming from either out to in too much and then it's like so close that it hits just this low left liner. Mm. Um, but if they're coming in at any point on the same angle and the face stays, you know, square to where it was coming in at, so it's not closing, it's not opening, then you're going to hit that nasty big slice. So you mentioned something um, in the in the three for three video, Mm -hmm. the three and the three. And you said that a slice and a pull hook are basically hitting the same quadrant, but your interaction with that quadrant with the club face is different. What do you mean by that? So I think that would help a lot of people because mm -hmm. the hook, the snap hook and the slice, they're in the same family outside in face closing rapidly, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think that one of the biggest variables, if people understood this, it would make more sense, is for chaff lane. Mm. So if I'm hitting the outside quadrant of the ball, like top outside quadrant, right? Yeah. Um, let's say that if I have the handle quite forward, right? And if I'm hitting down hard with the face like this, you're going to hit that low left hook because forward shaffling has one of the greatest influences with the path. Oh, okay. And okay. then it also manipulates the face because if the handle's forward, is the face going to tend to be a shut? No, no. it's going to naturally open it. Right. Right. To the target. Got it. So, um, again, like if I come into the ball and hit that outer quadrant like this with the same, like in a sense face angle, but there's no shaffling, the ball's oh, going to basically start left a little and then go it. big right got for it. a right handed golfer. So if because I get there, the handle, it's not going down as much, it's right. more across than down because the handle's not as forward. Correct. Got it. So when you forward press the handle also you're de-lofting the face right so that's changing like the dynamic loft like mm. if i the, if the handle's back and i'm hitting that outside quadrant this is the biggest slice you've ever seen like balloon <laughs> yeah. slice right yes, yes, absolutely. but again if i just de-loft and hit this now it turns into a low hook oh. so with forward shaffling then it makes more sense it's like you can hit a fade um consistently with shaffling right. it's just not as excessive as it would be for like your draw Got right it. and i can even say that um when i used to hit um I, I try to work the ball both ways in my game right and for me when i was trying to hit a fade if i wanted to hit a low fade i would just play it back and i would get the handle forward i would just open up the face like this just a little bit but keep the handle forward mm. to make sure that i didn't accidentally hit that straight shot got it got it right so i just did a little manipulating there um so that's why if we have a slicer the quickest mm-hmm. fix to get rid 
of that slice is forward, like forward strong press grip in strong grip. Yeah, because that once you get the hands <laughs> on the side and you're pushing against the handle, naturally you're starting to feel your shoulders and everything getting more close yeah. to the target. Right. Which also, so it's going to influence like the uh, direction that the club head is moving back in the takeaway, which is going to be more inward naturally. And then when you're coming through, you just push more back outward, and the ball is naturally going to go right to left because mm. you're in control of the path and the face angle which is allowing you to hit more of the inner quadrant of the ball which is right. what produces that more of that draw Correct. ball flight because the face is open to the target mm -hmm. but close to the path so think and yeah. so when you think of it this way relative to your toe alignment you mm -hmm. have like your toes if your toe alignment's perfectly parallel to um your target line right, right. like everything is square like this mm -hmm. and let's say that we're we're a little pre-close and we're driving at the inner quadrant we're hitting that little draw right right i'm going to basically take in my mind that exact image and I'm just going to open everything up at setup mm. to hit my fade. Mm. That's pretty much it. Handle, I mean, same I don't, forward shaft lean. So the shaft lean, maybe a little um, less. for a fade, I would typically say like the inside of my lead leg okay. would be the most that I would typically do it. Got it. Um, but just playing it back, you know, you can just drop the ball flight down with right. that. For sure. Um, but so for the fade... Um, when you think about like the face alignment, we have this square idea for our draw heading inner quadrant. We're going to take that exact same idea and I'm just going to turn everything, feet, knees, hips, and shoulders, and club. The face of the club, though, should not be in a sense, even though we're pointing left of the target, the face shouldn't be pointing at the target. It should still be square to my toe alignment. Mm. And the reason is, is because if you open the face and you're open, you're actually then bound to hit the inside quadrant. You hit the push fade. Push fade. Which where you if you right, have right. it square, you can hit the outer quadrant. And if you trust going down your toe line with the release, that will basically prevent you from getting stuck inside. Mm. And you'll be able to get the attack angle that you need. You know, Because when you hit a fade, you really do need to be coming in a little bit steeper into the ball. You know, yeah. Of course, shallower for a draw, right? Right, right. Um, so it's in, but it's, it's just, just these static adjustments that yeah, can make the exactly. world a difference. So like, like you don't have to, like what Jonathan's saying, we're not trying to do all these different things like in swing and like, no, don't change your grip or, or anything like change that. Change your grip. I always hear like, should I weaken my grip for a fade? It's like, what are you talking about? No, you like, should not. No, you don't have to. It's no. like once you get the proper um positioning. So I guess what we're trying to say again is you have like a stock swing, right? Right. Everyone should be able to hit a push draw. With their toe alignment square, a little yes. bit of pre-close, a little shaft lane, hit the inside quadrant, should go right to left for a right hand golfer, right? right? So if you can do that, then you just change, yes, your static adjustments at address, alignment, right. ball position a little bit and stuff. Then you can control your trajectory, your curvature, mm -hmm. everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, In so when I used to teach golf, one thing I used to tell a lot of my students is to explain this to them. I would say, go on YouTube and watch like a Bubba Watson highlight reel. <laughs> Because you're going to see all he does is changes his alignment. And with the pro tracers, you can see, uh, you know, 180 yeah. degree difference in the curves. Like, right. I mean, he can hit the biggest fade, the biggest draw on demand. But if you measured like what he was doing, like with his hands and arms and the it's all the and same it's movement. the exact same. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little more hold off when you're in a fade. Just sure. Because, like, but it's more of a, the, na it's natural though. Because effect. if you, so if you think about it, if I'm hitting the draw and I'm coming down into the inside, and I push through, and let's say I'm trying to stick my finish to right field, <laughs> this feeling of the pushing move and supporting the heel leading the toe yeah. is why it looks more of like a roll release for a right, like for the draw, right. right, going outward. But when you're hitting a fade, you're driving it the same way, mm. but because of the alignment to the target, it naturally looks like the club is being more held off. Oh, got it. Because it's just how it's like interacting with like what particular quadrant of the ball you're hitting. Yeah, right? relative to your intended yeah. target. Right, right. right. But got it's it. like this move makes um, has like a different reaction just based upon how you're aligned relative to your target. I mean, I've seen, I went through this myself and I've seen it with other golfers. They'll get onto a, a hole where there's like no trees around. It's just like wide open, right? Yeah. And they'll have like a simple 150 yard shot or even maybe a 100 yard wedge. And they'll miss the green by like 70 yards, right mm. or left. Right. And you're like, what the heck happened? <laughs> right. Right. But it was, it's just basically comes down to that is that you didn't trust the same move relative to your alignment. Like you didn't really know where you were aiming. Right. Right. To begin with. And yeah. it's like, you have to be able to do that. And that's why um, when we used to teach at Golf Tech, we were in a base setting yeah. on a box, you know, map, you know, shape right. and everything. And people could really start to understand like, 
the references. Yes. But you get outside. You get outside, and it's a, you know wide open and yeah, space <laughs> right. and environment, and it's like wow, it's really easy to lose that, and that's why too we always um, recommend when you're practicing to use alignment rods or shafts, like right. one down your toe line. We're gonna do that with our claw code videos. Exactly. Like, we're gonna walk gonna you set up how like, to practice. You're gonna set up your own box, yes. <laughs> your own little station, so you can understand like these reference points like we're talking about of like right. where is the 45 where is like your toe alignment where do we need the ball to, position yeah everything exactly ball right. position just right. simple little stations because then what will happen is you get on the golf course you'll actually be able to visualize them if right. you practice enough with them correct it becomes, yeah. yeah 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 exactly actually one more thing with forward shaft lane forward shaft lane with short game is yeah. kind of like frowned upon when i look at like social media all these coaches are like don't press the handle forward because then you're just going to dig the club into the ground it's like yeah, but if you use a little bit of twist, then you'll be able to thump the trailing edge and use the bounce. Mm -hmm. So you want a little bit of forward shaft lean with the short game. Why are all these coaches saying, like, you want it to be neutral? <clears throat> well, I think you know? that... Because yeah. they're saying, like, you'll dig too much with the leading edge, which is true if you don't, like, twist. But if you twist, like, you're going to be able to thump the trailing edge. So the one thing that... Yeah, I've never... Right? <laughs> I, well, the, the, yeah, the thing that kind of, like, baffles my mind is that, in my opinion, no matter how short the shot is in golf... Um, when you take the club face back, even if you kept it perfectly square, right? Yeah. When you're coming down into the ball, because of the direction you need to be pushing against the handle, you should be pushing on the trail side to where there is a slight um, clockwise rotation increase with the club to get the heel head started. Right. So that you can thump again the trailing edge. No, so it, nobody's talking about that, though. I know. And so, like, it's if like... you understand that concept, it's like <laughs> if I start with the handle neutral and I go back square and then I go under like that, you're not going to have um, a good low point. No. And the ball's going to probably be weak and going to the right. I had, But if you yeah. forward press and you get your weight on your lead side, then all of a sudden you can just come in. I mean, one of my favorite shots I teach all my students, and my best students will say this is like the simplest way to do it. You set up like a chip. So you put the ball off the inside of your trail foot. You have the handle pressed to like the middle or outside of your lead leg. Weight's like 80 on your left side, right? Low pre-close. And from there... You just basically let the face just twist a little bit open and just thump the trailing edge. And it'll give you literally like this like basic little chip shot that has a lot of spin. And then I do this one where you put everything in the same position, but you widen your stance a little bit. And then you open the face of hair. So you're going to open up your toe alignment and Got your it. shoulders and everything. Uh -huh. And that's like your, I call it a chip flop. Oh, because it right. has a pretty good trajectory. It's like low to mid, right. but it has ridiculous amounts of spin. Right. So it's like instead of trying to throw the ball way up in the air and you know hoping that you got the yeah, big swing the meaty, right, meaty part of the yeah, groups. it's like it's so inconsistent. Where yeah. if you can just take the smaller move in, because I mean, if you ask people, if all you really need is the spin, like you don't have. I mean, you have to get the ball up so high, right? Right. But if it can stop, you know, in a certain time frame. If that's all that matters, you're like then you're gonna go lower than going high <laughs> to make like this big move. Yeah, because... we talked about this last episode with Jax, where it's yeah. like when you do short game with him, he was having that hard time with those flop shots. Right. But it's like just taking too just, big of a move. Yeah, it's like make a smaller move. Like you're able to get more of the meaty part of the grooves, get the back. Exactly. Spin. Yeah, the spin he had, I would say he almost doubled his back spin. It's more important that you understand how to control like how the ball's squishing against the club face. Yeah. That's the most important thing. So when we're talking about all these coaches, I see this all the time when I'm like going through my feed on social media. I'm like, wait, like why are these coaches so against um, like forward shaft lane? It's like, okay, it's because they don't understand the twist enough. Right. Because if, yeah, if you press the handle forward and you don't twist, you're going to stab the leading edge. Right. So I get that. Yeah. But I mean, if you, you could twist, go, if you go into out enough and got the face angle open <laughs> yeah, enough, you could, but you could. it'd be a big push hook. But though. it's like, just get the handle forward. Yeah. I like it. Like for my students, I always try to get it like middle of the lead thigh. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's a good reference point. Maybe sometimes even outside it, depending yeah. on trajectory. And then just, like you said, a little bit of twist and then just hold the twist and thump the trailing edge. But mm -hmm. there's no talk about twist. Well, here's the, on, on, yeah, the well, twist from these is, coaches. they're just, or just we'll say like the proper um, uh, inward movement of the club as well as, yeah, the appropriate amount of twist. Correct. Because, you know, for a weak grip, it's going to be a little bit less than, of course, a strong. But true, one, true, one true. interesting thing, too, that I noticed when I was teaching is that um, I would always do bunker lessons, you know, with every student, right? Because everyone has to know. It. And that was one of the, everyone's pretty much worst parts of their game, yeah. right? And it was very interesting because... You know, they would come in and they would typically be weight kind of neutral, handle neutral, thinking, you know, it's like you set up almost with the handle back and then you have the face way open and you're trying to like splash. In. I mean, they understood the concepts, right? Right. Never could make it work, though. And I would get them to, of course, get a real wide stance that helps to shell out the arc. Right. Correct. Play the ball in the middle of your stance. Keep it simple. Put your weight 70 on your lead you know, side. Yep. Right. Yep. And then 
basically a setup, have the handle to the inside of your left leg, but have the face and the alignment of the body accordingly open, right? Got Every it. degree that you open your shoulders and hips and your feet, you're going to open the face Correct. in the same way, Yes. but the face is still square to your target line. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, so basically from there, it's like now just push, pull and twist mm -hmm. and then just thump the trailing edge. And you can, I would get, have them start off taking like a half swing. And I'm like, and really get aggressive and punch down two, three inches behind the ball. Right. And I mean, I took some of the uh, worst bunker players you've ever seen. <laughs> and in 30 minutes, I got them to hit multiple shots over and over again, putting it right by the pin. And they're like, right. they're like, so this is no different really than when I'm hitting my normal pitch no. shot. The only difference is I'm trying to hit three inches behind the ball with Correct. a little wider stance. I'm like, that's it. Wider stance to shallow out the arcs. So right. You don't stab at right. it too much. You can hit yeah. off any surface you could hit off a cart path like phil mickelson does all the time <laughs> right, right or you could hit off of like pine straw right if you understand how the club's going to react with its digging effect or its bouncing effect and every tour player understands it's like um, yeah a guy i want to talk about um in our next segment uh when we talk about tour players john rom i've seen him take like a four iron like get a huge wide stance mm -hmm. get the handle like maybe neutral even slightly back and hit a flop shot with like a four iron like savvy used to do from like on the edge of the green yeah, well, it's, a four crazy. Iron. It's, it's crazy, but it's like how you do that. You like wide stance, like super wide stance. So you can have like the, the shallowest arc yep. and then just basically just max twist and thump the trailing edge. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, for John Rahm, he would be doing a little different because he has a boat. So, you know, he would, he would boat up here, but when he's coming in though, he's definitely thumping that trailing edge. Yeah. To hit a flop shot with a four iron though. Like it's pretty cool. It's that's good awesome. bounce control. Right. Exactly. So it's yeah. not as hard as you actually would think it is though, as long as you just trust thumping the trailing edge. Right. And the sternum has to be like positioned properly. If you try to like help help it in the air you're oh yeah gonna, you're screwed yeah mm -hmm. you're gonna love have the low point effect uh so let's actually talk about rom um he played really good this weekend in uh the race to dubai and yeah we've talked about with our um three and three we talked about the weak grip and mm -hmm. how he um would actually use his swing because he has a weak grip so can you walk me through his swing a little bit yeah so i mean weak grip yep lead hand i would say is at 12 or almost at like one or i'm sorry 11 o'clock yep and then trail hand a little bit stronger, I'd say it's at about two, like we promote, uh -huh. right? And then when he goes back, basically, you know, he elongates this, you know, with the pushing, right? But right. I mean, um, to just show what he's doing, he's basically setting his wrist like this. Yeah. Then he goes up with the radio like we talk about. Then he does the under move. And then he basically just lets... So we, we talked about in our three and three about the lead hand pinky knuckle kind yeah. of rolling under. And he does that. But he's pushing so well against the side of the handle right. and pulling with like the the flexion of the lead wrist that he really can hold off that you know one thing. Hook basically. One thing I noticed with him too, in a little different from what we were saying. I'll just use my <laughs> smart grip here. Yeah. Um, so when he goes back, he's not like this way so much with the face he's almost like where you'd be with a neutral grip because of like how short his swing is right because mm -hmm. he's already like trying to get like that like a more external rotation he probably has a little more for the external. downswing transition right right but because he has such a short swing he's probably a little more toe up than most people with a weak grip would be would you agree with that I would say again, like I if I it, if I said it like this, yeah. If if I was to show you what that looks like by the time it gets to the takeaway, this is toe up, right? Right. Yeah, but so, like we're saying with a weak grip, that sometimes you're almost like that way in a sense. Oh like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, if you totally not, flexed it, like it would be like this. So yeah, well, yeah, his is a little bit more like that, like a neutral grip move. Right. Yeah. Because he has so much external yeah, rotation. Exactly. Yeah. His so hands it's a little are pushing bit pushing out away, and he has such a like short flat kind of like so swing we, we talked sense. about with that lead hand pinky knuckle when we explain that weak grip again and how you know some people will t like feel like they're rolling it under yeah. like we were just saying so it would be like this very hooded right? right but with him he's doing that move where we were talking about how he it is a little bit it. more it's it's a little bit under with the knuckle but it's a little bit more of like a rotation upward so you're like exposing the back of the lead wrist more to the sky right mm. but you're still kind of turning it under with that knuckle right, too so right. it becomes this in a sense like if i have a weak grip here it almost becomes a perfectly flat lead wrist yeah. at the takeaway right and then from there he basically just rolls the knuckles a little bit right and then he goes underneath with that's it, and that's, that's the it. key though if he didn't roll those knuckles then that face would technically be too open because that's yeah, more of like the that's neutral what, grip move that's right right so that little bit like you just did there with that rolling mm -hmm. that gets that face to where it's in the proper position so when he transitions down it's not too open from pre to post and it creates an yeah. um 
I like, that's that's it, a good point. It, it I creates like a, a lot of speed too because by twisting that last little bit right here, it's like you're really cranking the spring. <laughs> yeah. And then when you go under, it's like that spring is being the, like the tautness and tautness. all that pressure is being yeah. kept. Boom. And then right. from there, it's like this giant spring. And effect. then the giant spring effect when you said with the wheat grip with the release mm -hmm. is he's taking that like bottom like uh, pinky knuckle. Um, and he's really rolling that under in that Dude, rolling it's action. The same stops action the handle, it's, and it's right? the same action as he would use to the top. Right. It's the under move here that he's using to basically control the plane. Right. And then right. he's doing this to control the face relative to it. And, and when you do that too, it also stops the handle and lets the club like that's catapult, a big part. Right. Because right? if he keeps the index or I'm sorry, if he keeps his pinky knuckle facing the sky too much, he would then be starting to get more of a disconnection with the lead arm. From then you the get body, the turkey wing and you get the turkey <laughs> wing. Right. Exactly. Whereas, you know, when he does this again, it keeps like the under part of his lead arm connected to his chest then he can get the proper pivot point here and then he basically just pushes and holds that to the finish and he sticks his finish very well mm, um i love that though that makes nobody talks about that when i look at um like current golf instruction is that nobody's talking about the handle stopping like the handle has to like you're still and like, pushing well, and like against we said it, it's it's not but, like the handle goes like it's here and then it just literally stops like this and, and it you know the club head passes like that right. It's like the handle gets to the inside part of the lead leg. That by the time the club head goes from being up and back to down, right. the handle's being pushed forward approximately, I would say, about an inch or so. Yeah. And then the release happens. But the idea that you're trying to hit the ball first, then the ground, right? right. It's like you're basically trying to get the heel ahead of the inside part of the ball relative yes. to the target. Uh -huh. Then from there, the pressure being pinched down into it, like the squishing effect to yeah. the ball, that's where the handle stops initially. Right. Like that's the, and you'll see the club jar and yeah. you'll see the arms jar because of the contact to the ground. And then from there, the force or the rotations or the scraping effect and everything. So we'll say this. So we come down, we pin the heel to the inside quadrant of the ball on the ground. Mm -hmm. We're going to scrape for approximately three, four, six inches mm. up to, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. And then once that pressure is released from the ground, it naturally creates the kick effect. Oh. So it's like, again, we get the spring levered back, we pin it to the ground, we scrape. And then that naturally is going to release the spring. It's almost like trying to like pass a hockey puck. Right, right. Like you trap it yeah, to the you ice. Trap it, and, and then, then you, you and then you like yeah, and then you just like push, and right. then it, the shaft naturally or the stick um, kicks. And it's that it's that trail arm going from bent to straight. It's that like that's and the, the yeah. The golf swing needs punch. that because it needs that um, force to drive through the turf right. and to control the direction of all those forces that are being held back that are releasing. Yeah, because you could do everything Rom does. You could do the backswing perfect, mm -hmm. like you were saying with a little twist under yeah rerouting and get right here and if you don't have that trail arm going from bent to straight in that pinning action mm -hmm. and you just hold on and pull across or or, or, toast. or if you get the the turning down move here and you don't go from bent to straight then this happens mm. and then you get really shut because the right arm or the trail arm is now on top too much the palms pushing down on the face being too open so you're just going to smother it in the ground close, or dig yeah. a crater right. Uh -huh. right but if i get the trail arm to go from bent to straight pushing it's like now you can see when i get full extension in the trail arm the face is perfectly square this is why we like sticking the finish like the that's image, what it is yeah you're the image, this is the like so can we what, talk about that a little more so like we're gonna talk about this at the studio but yeah let's talk about that a little more so let's reflect it back to the scrape right okay. so we get the scrape and then once you're done the scrape is impact scraping the club well, face against the ground right you're pinning the heel of the ground the heel. Yep. right the, so basically from the heel to the toe the heel is leading slightly once you make contact to the ground from the heel to the toe maybe not all the way to the very tip of the toe but at least three quarters up the face is going to be making contact to the surface of the ground mm. okay then from there we're going to scrape that and keep that distance of the club face on the ground consistently and if all the forces are good the divot will be paper thin. It's not mm, going to be too deep, right? Got it. And then once the club kicks from the scraping action, right, we're basically trying to, like when we think about the trail, I'm going from bent straight and we're driving that trail palm, keeping it cupped. Right. We're trying to like, in a sense, drive it down into the ground and leave it there. Mm. So once the club kicks back up from its natural rehinge back up, we're trying to leave it right back down there. So right. we're trying to control the forces, um, like the direction all the forces are being applied, right. opposed to getting to pre-impact. Let's say we drive like, and we scrape 
to impact. And then after there, if we just let go, like, and just let the arms do <laughs> what they want to the do, body. it can work, but it's yeah. just not going to be as controlled and consistent as if you actually drive. It's the all whole, about the like, forces being applied to the handle. Right. That's why we censored this up when we created the smart grip. It was like, we wanted to measure that force being applied to the handle. And I mean, it's insane how much pressure is being applied to the handle. And that's why, I mean, it all goes back to the claws because if you have it in the knuckle pads properly, you can apply the most amount of force and get the most amount of leverage. So that's where yeah. basically that's um, how we figured out this whole thing with the prototype. Correct. Is because we, I understood like the claws, wrote yeah. the whole code for it. Right. And now we're like, okay, how can we get this to be measured? Right. And, you know, basically used for training and, you know, playing purposes. Yeah. So, uh, but now we've basically... Um, even though this is all in the works still, uh, we're now like trying to get people to understand the clause more and we're yeah. going to start to launch that because if you are already, um, understanding that and going through like, let's say our archive training, right. you know, and stuff, you're going to be totally ready for this thing. It's just going to make your life super easy. Like you'll never need to buy another training aid because yeah. this thing is going to monitor everything you're doing Correct. and explain it to you. This like, is going to be you... the coach. Yeah, exactly. We're it making gonna... teaching pros like us obsolete. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah. just, you can still use a pro. Oh, right, right. <laughs> they, they could help you understand like the data and like everything that's being measured this and is just like more that. monitored but, practice yeah, that's, exactly. that's really what yeah because we is. saw that all the time where we like we're doing lessons with people and um we'd we'd have a really good lesson with them and then we'd see them a week later and it's like what, what yeah what'd you do what did you like, do oh i swung 20 times at but home it's like, it's like i wish we could like but then we were telling ourselves like man what if we could like program drills into this thing that's and, it like, and then that was like wow now we can really make sure that people are practicing properly so right. um yeah that's all coming soon um what about cam smith He's really similar to Rom. He's got a little more of a neutral grip opposed to a weak grip with the lead hand, mm -hmm. but similar kind of move where he kind of goes like under with the lead wrist. Um, he, he's his, a little more he like across the line. Though. I would say he's not, it's not that he really goes um, un like he doesn't roll it under like this. Right, it right. looks like it because he goes inward with the hands first. Got it. So his, the first, like I would say two feet of his backswing, he goes in probably two inches right. total. But then because the so what that goes, does is yeah. because the handle's in and the club's, you know, pointing out, like opposed to if the handle was going out and the club's going back behind, it would look like this. So to the top, it would be like a flatter plane yeah. here where with Cam, he goes in first like this. And then from there, when he hinges, it creates a little bit more of like a vertical plane. So basically, if you work the handle more inside and then you hinge, that's what causes this across the line concept. Right. Right. And across the line is referencing to the target line. Right. Like so that we talked about, you know, you got your toe line and you got the straight line through the face. Right. right at address. So basically, if you if the club head goes outside of that line, in a sense, yeah. like of being like um, we got like straight we got the 90 degree plane and we got the 45. So if you cross that 90, <laughs> right, that's a cross. So but, Matthew Wolf would be a perfect and like just yeah, to the max. Because he goes like this and he goes, he goes in with straight the out and then it. across. Yep. Got it. Um, but with with Cam Smith, though, yeah, just he goes a little bit across line, which I think you look at him up to maybe like a five iron. It's actually on plane. His face is shut. Right. Well, it's because when he goes back, when he goes in, it does hood the face. And got then it. from there, he doesn't twist it open at all. He just hinges. Oh, God. And then it. that's why when he comes through, he works the hands back slightly inward. I'd say approximately two inches again from like impact to post impact. So it's really similar to like Hovland in a yeah. sense of like how he does it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because Hovland just really shuts it. Really shuts it. Yeah. Cam yeah. It's a little less extreme than that. But um, yeah. Cam you know, Smith, he doesn't go like super in with the hands. No, though. no. I'm not saying like Matthew Wolf. Think style. two inches. Two Got inches it. is not, <laughs> yeah, a, lot, not a lot, especially <laughs> over a period of time from like the address to the takeaway. Right, right. Got right, it. Right. Yeah, it's it's funny because uh, you look at, like, I look at Rom's move and I look at Cam Smith's move and, like, at the half position, they're very similar. But then where they go from there is, like, completely different. It's like mm -hmm. Cam Smith goes vertical and up and across the line and Rom goes, like, as flat as possible. Right. But it just shows why, like, the length of the swing has so much to do with, like, the effective, like, plane. Right. Well, yeah. and something interesting too is like if you look at Cam Smith and Victor Hovland, so like the first move, they go in with the hands, and then Victor, you know, he rolls it under like this and then goes basically vertical with it, which right. actually, in a sense, the vertical becomes an across the line move because he goes in so much with the hood face. It's like the hinge is going like this. <laughs> yeah. So then from right. there, um, we talked about in our one podcast about how he uses his head rotation. Yeah, so he allows one, his yeah. head to look at the target to help him once he gets it back underneath right. on plane. He's basically doing that to help him himself 
uh, well, he basically goes down the line or a little bit to right field, we'll say, when he typically releases. Mm -hmm. But between that and the head rotation, that's what allows him to control that shot face. Yeah, because his exit path is low and left. Yes. Like, because he has to. Right. Because, I mean, like, it's very it's very similar to Cam Smith, which mm -hmm. is their exit path and everything. And how the club is working from pre to post impact is, like, almost identical. It is, though, yeah. 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 I th yeah I'm, how does he get it so if you get it like vertical like that what's the move to get it to lay down to get it, it like just in getting the, the butt so if you get here it's like getting the butt into the club to go back out the club head will naturally fall right back on the same okay like like plaz so they say actually i would say that it's is easy to get inside out with an across the line swing yeah or easier even yeah, than it is for an on plane swing right <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> which is kind of hard to believe but i mean it comes back to that whole thing we talked about with like baseball and stuff Relating how if the you get the um, bat or the club vertical, yeah, and then it's it's more natural to let it lay down, right, 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 and then you're getting more of a um, like the energies that are laying down basically are only helping you build more lag right. and to stay on the proper path opposed to if you go in too much and get real flat, the natural tendency is going to be to want to come, come over, over the plane, right, 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 yeah, which I mean. Which yeah. is a very common tendency. Very common. Yeah. That's why when Tiger back in like 97 and 96 and all those years, um, when he made that change with Butch, it's because he was so, he noticed that he was so in and across the line yeah. when he looked at his footage from 97 Masters. Mm -hmm. So Butch basically just made the transition to like, okay, we'll get your takeaway better. And then we'll just basically get you like the perfect hand and arm Absolutely. move from like the takeaway to the top. Mm -hmm. So then now it's like, okay, it's easier to transition down get the hands in front of him because yeah, he was just he said he perfect, had that like ole like where his hips would get going quick, oh yeah hands would drop behind yep. him and then yep. he's yep. toast from there right so, yeah um finau very similar to a lot of um trail wrist like extension with finau like mm -hmm. he's he's very like trail wrist um like centric i Absolutely. would say yeah 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 um and he's a little bit weaker with the grip as well um but yeah, he gets like a lot of extension right off the bat. Yeah, he presets um, he, he's his He's getting wrist, a little more vertical with which, the club yeah, too. Yeah, he definitely he was because he like was really doing in. he was doing one of these sets like like <laughs> literally side to side. Right. So the club head was getting a little bit like the club head was still a little bit almost below his hands when the club was parallel to the ground in the takeaway. Yeah. Which typically, if you're there, then the next move is going to be underneath the plane still, and then coming up to the plane, which then that natural move of going in with the club is going to naturally want to make it come back across but, the line, like we were saying. Yeah. With, right. Because Fino is so tall. <laughs> and everything and you know and he right. has that big under move and he kind of made that work but i like yeah. i like it how more vertical I, yeah. yeah i was telling you back when yeah, i was you uh, first seeing this i was like if he You're just like, got the preset more like vertical here like that because he likes to hit a fade yeah he does it would actually help him get rid of that occasional hook yeah and it's weird like he used to always do that and then he got away from it and started getting more in it's like wait why are we like i don't then know he went know, through that like little he bit of slump need depth. yeah it's like it's depth. so easy for him right because he's so tall and so like he can manipulate his wrists and he's like gumby he's like yeah <laughs> yeah 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 he's very like uh flexible with the wrist and arms and yeah can do a lot of crazy things so um it's good to see Finau playing good though three, yeah one three out of his last seven i mean i wish i the could swing player. I, I wish i was that tall and big because it's like just swing that easy in a sense or that short that far. And, and yeah it just makes it look too easy yeah 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 <laughs> which is why he can stand a little closer to the ball too right you right. say like tall people can stand really because he has to the that ball. big inside transition move right because of like how flexible his wrists are or like it's why? a combination of that and he's just got a really good golf swing i mean when you right. look at it yeah. anybody that stands closer to the ball in general they have a more exaggerated typically like kind of inside move and like you know as we say everybody has to get here at pre-impact with yes. the trail arm correct you correct. know yep. and being externally rotated in the mm -hmm. trail wrist cup so if he has that with the flexibility and the length of his arms like it's giving him more time to let the club transition properly right 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 yeah so so yeah good to see him playing good yep um you know golf's gonna kind of slow down a little bit now uh just with the holidays and everything which is uh, which is fine. We'll be watching a lot of football. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully Michigan can pull it off this weekend. Yep. Beat Ohio State. That would make – that's like my national championship. Like if we beat Ohio State, then yeah. there's there's nothing better in the world. So, um, yeah. All right, cool. We got to wrap. Um, we got a busy day today with your birthday and everything, and I'm going to go shoot some content in the studio. Uh, so stay on the lookout for that. Um, yeah, appreciate all the support we've been getting. Um, stay, stay tuned on all of our social – Links are all in the bottom. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed just kind of us just kind of nerding out about the golf swing. That was kind of cool just to talk about these different pros and for shaffling though, I'll let that be the theme of today. Cause sure. it's not being talked about enough and um, you need to understand it. And when we start talking about um, the golf swing, 
this handle right here is very misunderstood. So that's why we wrap sensors on it and started collecting data on how it works. And, exactly. Um, yeah. We'll have all that out very soon for you because we figured out a lot of things that were kind of hidden. So, right. um, yeah, thanks again. Appreciate everybody watching and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah, thanks.